the looming conflict between Iran, Israel, and the United States in the Middle East has reached a critical juncture, with both sides preparing for a potential military escalation that could reshape the region. Central to this rising tension is the deployment of the American THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, to Israel, alongside the bolstering of U.S. troop presence in the area. While such moves may appear on the surface to be defensive, aimed at protecting Israel from Iran's highly maneuverable missile capabilities, many experts, including Scott Ritter, argue that the reality is far more complex and politically driven. Scott Ritter, a former Marine Intelligence Officer and United Nations Weapons Inspector, recently shared his insights on the Judge Napolitano show. Ritter emphasized that the deployment of the THAAD system and additional U.S. troops is more symbolic than practical in the face of a massive Iranian retaliatory attack. The THAAD system, while sophisticated in its ability to intercept short- and medium-range ballistic missiles, is limited in its capacity to address the sheer volume and maneuverability of Iran's missile arsenal. Iran's missile forces, which include a range of ballistic and cruise missiles capable of evading advanced defense systems, could overwhelm the relatively small number of interceptors that Thad possesses. In Ritter's view, the U.S. decision to send Thad to Israel is not a purely defensive maneuver. Instead, it's a calculated political move designed to project strength and reassure Israel that the U.S. remains committed to its security. However, the timing and nature of the deployment raise questions about its true purpose. As Ritter pointed out, Israel's threats to bomb Iranian nuclear facilities have escalated tensions, and the presence of U.S. troops in Israel could further complicate the situation. Any Israeli strike on Iran would likely provoke a massive Iranian counterattack, which could inadvertently lead to American casualties if U.S. service members stationed in Israel are caught in the crossfire. This, in turn, would drag the U.S. deeper into the conflict and likely escalate it beyond the region. The ripple effects of such a scenario could be profound. If Iran retaliates against Israel for an airstrike on its facilities, the U.S. would likely step in to defend its ally. Yet this involvement would trigger a broader regional war, with Iran-backed groups such as Hezbollah and other resistance movements targeting both Israeli and American interests. The already volatile Middle East would be plunged into deeper chaos, with major implications for global security. Videos like this are often not promoted by YouTube, so we encourage you to help it reach more people by liking and sharing it with your friends and family. Subscribe to stay informed on the latest developments in Lebanon and Gaza. The uh, United States announced that it is sending uh, a THAAD, T-H-A-A-D, um, defensive uh, device, along with 100 or so American troops to operate it to Israel. What can you tell us about THAAD? Is it uh, effective? Is it top of the line or... Why are we sending it? Well, it's interesting because some of the reports that came out said this is the first time the U.S. has ever done this. It's not. During the Gulf War in 1991, we sent Patriot batteries to Israel, and uh, they were actively involved in trying to intercept Iraqi Scud missiles. In 2003, we sent Patriot batteries back to Israel under fear that Iraq might be firing uh, missiles into Israel. Uh, per, in, in terms of the FAD, we sent the FAD there um, – uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 2019, I think, uh, as part of an exercise. Uh, uh, after the October 7th attack, we sent a FAD unit back to Novatim Air Base uh, because that's where we fly in our uh, equipment. That's the main receiving base. So we sent the FAD there, and um, uh, along with about 60 uh, soldiers, I guess we pulled that out because now we're sending it back. The FAD is a, is a, an advancement on the... Um, the, the Patriots, an advancement on the Arrow uh, 2, the Arrow 3, David Sling that the Israelis have. Um, it's it's a, a missile that allows intercept at a higher altitude, and it's linked to a uh, radar, a very effective radar, um, that, uh, that um, I think an S-band radar that's able to detect uh, and, 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 and develop firing solutions on multiple targets at once. Uh, in theory, um, you know, it's supposed to be a good system. The fact is, though, 
this is not a new system. It's been around for a while and it's using technology and techniques that predate, you know, the hypersonic missile capabilities. This is not a system that's uh, capable of intercepting hypersonic uh, weapons, especially if the hypersonic weapons um, flood the system, flood the zone, as uh, Iran has shown its tactics. So, you know, again, this is, um, you know, a system that's put in to try and enhance um, the defense of Israel. Clearly, uh, it failed um, on October uh, 1st. And, you um, the feeling is right now that Israel and the United States don't have a solution to the Iranian missile threat. The Thad is supposed to provide additional capabilities um, to, you know, to to deter. I guess that's the hope is that you tell the uh, Iranians now we have something that can shoot you down, but it doesn't. There's nothing they the Thad will not be able to stop an Iranian missile attack. First of all, even if they fire everything. My understanding is there's 48 interceptors, very expensive system, by the way. And, um, you know, if Iran files 200 missiles and all 48 work, uh, I'm, I'm a simple Marine, but that still tells me that there's, uh, you know, 152, uh, inbound missiles that Thad didn't get. So, um, you know, this is just part of the political game the U S is playing by telling Israel, we have your back defensively in an effort to prevent Israel from carrying out offensive operations against Iran. What do you think will happen, uh, if the Iranians destroy, uh, the Thad, uh, and kill Americans in the process? And maybe before you answer that, why, why are Americans going there? Are Israelis not trained or trainable in a short period of time to use this or only Americans able to uh, to operate this equipment? This is an American-only system. The Israelis don't have this system. Um, and we, so only Americans can operate this. Uh, you know, at some point in time, I guess we could sell this system to the Israelis, but it has more capabilities than the Israelis need. Um, and I think the feeling was that by jointly working with Israel to develop the Arrow 2, Arrow 3, and David Sling um, interceptors, that they would provide THAAD-like capabilities. Uh, clearly, that's not the case. So now the THAAD is deployed. But uh, what would happen um, if it gets hit? Well, I mean, the U.S. has no legal argument. Uh, if the U.S. engages Iran, then it's an active you know, participant in this conflict. Um, and it can it will pay the price. They're not neutral. They're not uh, you know innocents. Uh, they are active participants. And then the question is, what does the United States do in response to that? I don't think Iran would deliberately target uh, the Thad system. Um, you know they don't need to. It's not it's it's not a game changing uh, technology. Um, as I said before, the number of interceptors does not shift the balance of power to Israel. And uh, if the Iranian goal and objective is to take out critical infrastructure and the Thad is being positioned to protect, you know, Navatam airfield, then, you know, never the two shall meet, perhaps. But, um, you know, what would happen if dozens of Americans were killed or injured? Then America would have to retaliate. We have to. I mean, I'm not saying that I would like this, but as a military commander, I would tell my president and I would have told him before we go in, I said, by deploying these troops. You do understand that if they take casualties, we must respond decisively because we cannot create the conditions under which nations around the world believe that they can strike Americans and flick casualties and get away with it. We have to deter people from doing this. So if Iran strikes us, we must hit Iran back hard and we must be prepared to do that right now with the forces on hand. Are you ready to do that, Mr. President? That's really the conversation. Do you think somebody spoke to him that way or spoke to Lloyd Austin that way or Lloyd Austin told him what you just said? I can guarantee you if a Marine was involved in this, that's exactly how they would have been spoken <laughs> to. I can't vouch for the Air Force it's and the just, Army. I don't think General Austin is a Marine or was a Marine. No, he was a, he was Army. Um, but he's dealt with Marines before. Look, and I'm, I'm not going to denigrate the professionalism of the other branches. Uh, anybody who is entrusted with the lives of the of American service members um, must protect those lives, which means you don't irresponsibly deploy them um, without a plan on how to defend them. And right. if they take casualties, then you must take out that which inflicted the casualties. You must do so decisively, um, you know, or else we have a USS Liberty situation all over again. 
Um, I'm going to read to you from Israeli Channel 14, which was sent to me by one of our uh, colleagues, Alistair Crook. Uh, this is about 15 minutes old now. Israel's retaliation against Iran will not be moderate. Instead, it will be significant and will likely cause Iran to respond. Israel will need to prepare for a significant exchange of blows that might drag the Americans in, which Iran certainly would not want. Israel will attack Iran before the U.S. elections. Netanyahu approved the attack plans on Iran, and the attack is expected soon. What do you think will happen? Well, it's interesting because in parallel to this, um, we have a statement by a, a senior Iranian foreign ministry official, a spokesperson, um, basically saying there will be no more um, back-channel communication with the United States. Apparently, um, the Iranians and Americans were talking behind the scenes to, um, to you know, come up with a scenario on how to avoid escalation. And um, somebody in the United States leaked out that Iran had agreed to, um, to, to absorb a limited Israeli strike and not retaliate, which is a complete deviation from you know, Iran's stated uh, posture. And uh, by leaking this, this was a huge embarrassment to the Iranians. Um, and so the Iranians uh, said, we're done. Um, and now Israel's left with, um, you know, the following options. Don't strike, um, do a moderate strike. But now we don't know, we being Israel and the United States, how Iran will respond because the U.S. blew it. I mean, you can't have these behind the scenes back channel talks and then go public with them. Uh, it's something the United States does on a regular basis because, you know, we have to feed the press. But uh, it embarrassed the Iranians, put them in a very difficult situation, and now they've withdrawn. And so I think Netanyahu. Um, had come to the you know, decision point that he can't not respond. He has to respond. And since you can't differentiate between a moderate and a severe response in terms of Iranian uh, re retaliation, you might as well go severe. And now you're daring the United States not to do anything. Uh, this is the ultimate goal. This is a huge gambit on the part of Israel. They're going to begin something that left to their own devices, they will lose in a conventional exchange. Um, meaning that they will start to strike Iran. There's no way they can bring um, the firepower to bear on Iran that can suppress what Iran is prepared to fire into Israel. And when Iran attacks Israel this next time, they will take out $100 billion worth of critical infrastructure and shut Israel down as a modern nation state. At that point in time, Israel is desperately hoping that America will join them in continuing and furthering the strikes against Iran of an existential nature, meaning that they will seek to end the Iranian regime. Um, that's where we're heading. And, uh, you know, what I'll also say is that in the past uh, months and weeks, the Iranians have made it clear that the fatwa, uh, the religious edict that was uh, passed by the supreme leader that prohibited Iran from having nuclear weapons is no longer in play that that can be reconsidered by a change in conditions, and the conditions have changed. Iran is ready to go nuclear if Israel pushes them in that direction. And if Israel starts targeting Iranian leadership, uh, command and control, or nuclear facilities, Iran will have a nuclear weapon in less than a week. They'll have three to five in less than two weeks, and they will use them against Israel and take Israel off the face of the earth. This is the direction we're heading, Judge. This is a very dangerous situation. What direction are we heading with respect to American involvement three weeks before a presidential election? Well, what I what I will say is there's no congressional. I mean, we don't see Congress convening, discussing uh, the you know war and the reasons why we would go to war. We don't see any effort by the president to come to Congress and say, hey, this is a dangerous situation. I think we need to have congressional hearings that empower me to carry out massive military operations if the conditions are met. I know we have a War Powers Act, but those are supposed to be for, you know, events that weren't predictable. Uh, we were surprised attacked. The president must respond. Um, this right here is a deliberate uh, lead up to a predictable conflict. Congress needs to be involved because, as I said, uh, this, this is the kind of conflict, if it gets out of control, will involve nuclear weapons and will involve Americans um, perhaps being on the receiving end of nuclear weapons or maybe using nuclear weapons against Iran. I know the President of the United States have, has exclusive authority to use nuclear weapons, but war is war, and Congress is the only 
entity constitutionally permitted to take us into war. This is not an emergency. This is deliberate regime change type conflict that Congress should be involved in. And yet there's no, there's, there's no interest on the part of Congress to have any such hearings. Ritter argues that the era of Israeli belligerence in the region is nearing its end. While Israel has long operated with impunity, launching strikes in Syria, Lebanon, and Gaza, the strategic landscape is shifting. Iran and its allies have strengthened their capabilities, and Israel can no longer act with the same freedom it once had. Ritter suggests that Israel must now operate more like a normal country, subject to international law and regional power dynamics. This is particularly true given that any significant Israeli military action could ignite a conflict that spirals out of its control, particularly if Iran's response proves more devastating than anticipated. The U.S., by deploying its THAAD system and troops, may have intended to bolster Israel's defenses and signal its unwavering support. However, this move could backfire by encouraging Israeli aggression under the assumption that U.S. military support will shield it from consequences. Ritter believes that this emboldens Israel, giving it a false sense of security in escalating tensions with Iran, particularly since the U.S. system alone will not suffice against a large-scale Iranian missile barrage. I'm sorry to say that you're 100% correct under the Constitution. I say I'm sorry to say... Uh, because of your last comment, there is no interest on the part of Congress to do its duty, which is to debate war and decide whether or not we should go to war. We have signed several uh, international treaties which say we can only go to war against a country where we are obliged to defend an ally by treaty, not the case with Israel, or where the other country that we're going to de on which we're going to declare war poses a serious, imminent a grave threat to American national security, not the case with respect to Iran. Uh, we also have a president, and it's not just him. His predecessors have been the same. We don't like to consult with Congress. They like to just do things on their own. In what form would American aid to Israel take if Iran really uh, unloads on Israel and Netanyahu feels uh, trapped or defeated or desperate? The United States has said consistently since the uh, regime, regime, I'm sorry, administration of Barack Obama, that uh, it would not tolerate Iran developing a nuclear weapons capability, that this would be war. Obama took it straight up to the uh, edge of conflict before he realized that um, he had he was going to war against a country that didn't have a nuclear weapons program and he had left himself no option. So that's where the uh, Iran nuclear deal came from to get us out of um, the situation. Donald Trump came in and said that if Iran develops a nuclear weapons capability, America will go to war against it. Um, and he withdrew from the joint comprehensive pr plan of action. Uh, and now we have Joe Biden saying the same thing. Under no circumstances will Iran be allowed to develop nuclear weapons capability. Judge, I just told you, Iran has nuclear weapons capability right now as we speak. They don't have a functioning weapon, but they have the ability to produce a weapon in a matter of days. And they have made the political decision through declaratory policy that this is what they're going to do if pushed to it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Iran is a nuclear power which means that if Israel gets hit with existential uh, you know, force by Iran, stuff that shuts the lights out, shuts the water out, and Israel starts uh, saying we have to target Iran's nuclear capability, um, and Israel says we need to use nukes. The United States understands that if Israel nukes Iran, Iran will nuke Israel, and so the United States may very well get into a preemptive attack against Iran using nuclear weapons. This is where we're at. This is the insanity, and we forget that Vladimir Putin just met with the Iranian president in Turkmenistan where they have cut some sort of deal. They have an ongoing security relationship. I don't think Russia sits by and lets the United States use nuclear weapons against Iran. So now we're talking about a potential U.S.-Russia conflagration that could go nuclear. This is why Congress has to be involved. These are things that the American people need to be assured of that their representatives are discussing. Um, the potential of a world-ending nuclear event because Israel can't defeat Hamas and can't defeat Hezbollah. Israel is committing genocide against people. Um, Israel is a irresponsible rogue nation 
And um, Iran is part of the a, 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 a axis of resistance that is holding Israel to account in a managed, responsible fashion. Iran didn't start this fight. Israel did by assassinating, yeah. by attacking Iranian diplomatic facilities in Damascus, assassinating senior Hamas leadership inside Tehran. Could you imagine during the inauguration of the next president on January 20th that we invited somebody, we the United States, because the president represents we the people, invites somebody to the inauguration. They sit in and they are there. They're in the inauguration. The president has them stand up. There's applause. They shake hands and all that. He goes back to his hotel and somebody assassinates him. Do we just sit there and go, oh, yeah, that's OK. No, it's an act of war, an act of war. Israel has committed acts of war against Iran. And now Iran is responding in warlike fashion, but measured. Iran said it's over. We don't need to go on. But if Israel chooses to go on, that's because Israel is trying to make this an existential issue where only one one side walks away from this. And the United States is going to get caught up into this. Please In the broader context, this deployment also raises serious questions about the U.S. role in perpetuating conflicts of, uh, in the Middle East. Ritter pointed out that this move essentially erases any human rights record the U.S. once claimed to uphold. By siding so heavily with Israel, particularly as it continues its airstrikes and operations in Gaza and Lebanon, the U.S. appears to be contributing to the cycle of violence rather than fostering stability in the region. This involvement risks making the U.S. a direct participant in any conflict that may erupt, thereby placing American personnel and interests at significant risk. Looking forward, the prospect of a war involving Iran, Israel, and the U.S. seems increasingly likely unless significant diplomatic efforts are made to de-escalate tensions. Ritter has warned that Iran is more than capable of defending itself and inflicting significant damage on Israel should it come to that. With advanced missile technology, a vast network of regional allies, and a deep-rooted resistance against Israeli and U.S. influence in the Middle East, Iran is not the same opponent it once was. The consequences of a war in this region would be felt far beyond the borders of Israel and Iran. Oil markets could be thrown into turmoil, global shipping lanes disrupted, and the humanitarian toll would likely be immense particularly if Hezbollah and other groups launch their own offensives against Israel. The U.S., for its part, would face a difficult balancing act between supporting its ally Israel and avoiding a full-blown regional war that could draw in other nations, including Saudi Arabia, Russia and Turkey. In conclusion, while the deployment of the American Thad system and additional U.S. troops to Israel may be intended as a deterrent, it is clear that this strategy carries significant risks. As Scott Ritter and others have pointed out, the ability of Thadi to defend against a large-scale Iranian missile attack is limited, and the presence of U.S. forces could further complicate an already tense situation. Rather than de-escalating tensions, these moves might embolden Israel to act aggressively, with catastrophic consequences for the entire region. The next steps taken by the U.S., Israel, and Iran will likely determine the course of the Middle East for years to come, with war hanging precariously on the horizon.